Section 2.8 is about the derivative function. So far, we've just talked about the derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line, which is the instantaneous rate of change of a function at a particular point. But I want to look at the work I've got here on the board. I've given us an example of a function f of x equals x squared. And what I've done is I've worked out the derivatives. I've worked out the limits that give me the derivative at three different points. So here I've just sort of got a generic picture. The point of tangency we're saying is a, and then of course the y value would be a squared. An even more generic version would be just a f of a. And then for our nearby point, we label that with the variable x. So for this particular function, it would be x, x squared. The very generic version of that would be x, f of x. And then here's our formula for finding the derivative at that particular point, a. It's the limit as x goes to a of this thing, which is just the slope of the secant line. The rise is the difference in y values, so that's f of x minus f of a. The run is the difference in x values, so that's just x minus a. All right, so I've worked that out for these three problems here. Using this function for f, the squaring function, f prime at 1 is the limit as x goes to 1. x squared minus 1 squared is just 1 over x minus 1. Of course, any time we set up this limit, it should lead to an indeterminate form. Because if this point is getting closer and closer to this point, both the rise and the run are going to zero. Since we're working with polynomials here, we know to just factor and cancel. So the top factors as a difference of two squares, we cancel the x minus one, we get the limit as x goes to one of x plus one, we get two. Okay, so now I've changed it to let's find the derivative at 2. But the work feels very similar. I set up the limit as x goes to 2, rise over run, and they both go to 0. I'm working with polynomials, so I factor. And again, the top factors is a difference of 2 squares. Factor and cancel, plug in, and I get 4. Okay. And then I did the same thing here to find the derivative at 3. It's the limit as x goes to 3. Rise and run both go to 0. We factor and cancel, and we get 6. So I can create this table of values. When a was 1, f prime of a was 2. When a was 2, f prime of a was 4. When a was 3, f prime of 3 was 6. Now this notation here suggests that f prime is itself a function. It's a function so that when I plug in 1, I get out 2. When I plug in 2, I get out 4. It's a function so that when I plug in the x value of the point of tangency, I get out the derivative, or the slope of the tangent line at that point. So here, the work started to feel kind of redundant. It felt like I was doing the same thing and just changing a few numbers. So it would be really nice if I could come up with a formula for an arbitrary point of tangency. Instead of picking a specific number for the x value of the point of tangency, I'm going to call it x. And then what I'm going to find is f prime at x. I'm going to find a formula that will give me the slope of the tangent line at that point. If I'm successful in doing that, then when I want to evaluate the derivative of this function at 5, I wouldn't have to do a new limit. I could just plug 5 into this formula. So it's a way of calculating infinitely many derivatives at once by just choosing an arbitrary point x. So let's see how that would work. Now I've got this picture here labeled for finding the derivative at a point A. The big difference here is that I'm going to just be labeling my points differently. I now want x to be the point of tangency. 
So I'm going to label this point x and then x squared. We'll work it out for this specific example first, and then we'll generalize to an arbitrary function f of x. But now I've named my first point x, x squared. Here, that was what I labeled my second point. So I can't, when I go to find a nearby point, I can't call it x comma x squared. I have to call it something else. What I'm going to do, this is x right here. I'm going to call my nearby point x plus h. So that h here is the signed distance between my x values. So instead of focusing on what this second x value is, I'm focusing on how far away it is from x. And I said it's a signed distance because you might have been surprised that I put x plus h to the left of x. I did that on purpose to point out that we should not assume that h is necessarily a positive number. If h is a negative number, that's going to mean that x plus h is to the left of x. If h is a positive number, x plus h would be to the right of x. So the sine of h will tell me whether I'm to the left or to the right of the point of tangency. So now if I label this point here, that's going to be x plus h comma x plus h squared. Okay. Now, I don't have to label my points this way, but it's a nice, actually fairly simple way of doing things. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but what's nice about it is if I label my points this way, it's going to start to feel routine. I'm always just saying x and then a nearby point, and I'm emphasizing that it's nearby by expressing it in terms of its signed distance from x. Okay. So then here's my secant line. And so I can say f prime at x is going to be the limit. Now, what I'm doing is I'm moving this point closer and closer to this point. And I accomplish that by making the x values get closer and closer together. What's nice about that is that just means I'm letting h go to zero. Okay. So if I label my points this way, I'm always going to be taking a limit as h, the signed distance between my inputs, goes to zero. And then it's just going to be rise over run. So that would be x plus h squared minus x squared over x plus h minus x. Now, I generally like to do my subtraction so that I start with the more complicated point and subtract the simpler point, which is the point of tangency. That's for two reasons. One, that puts the negative sign in front of the simpler expression so that I'm less likely to have to worry about distributing a negative, although sometimes I will still have to do that. Two, let's take a look at how the bottom simplifies. This is the limit as h goes to zero. On bottom, x plus h minus x is just h. Now that actually makes a lot of sense. This is supposed to be the slope of the secant line. Secant line is rise over run. What's run? It's the signed distance between the x values. So I've set it up so that h is my run. But notice, while it would be okay to set this up so that I was subtracting in the other order, so that the limit is h goes to zero of x squared minus x plus h squared over x minus x plus h. If I did this, I've got to make sure that I'm subtracting that whole thing. I would have to distribute that negative, and this would become the limit as h goes to 0 of x squared minus x plus h squared over negative h. If I subtract in that order, it's not wrong, but it's going to introduce a negative sign in the denominator. It's just a little bit more complicated. 
So I'm always going to be strategically lazy and go for the simpler setup. Okay, now let's work this out. So x plus h squared, let's remember that's x plus h times x plus h. This exponent does not distribute over that addition. But now I can just FOIL that out. Let's see. I'm running out of space, so I think I'm going to erase my picture over here and continue the work over here. So, we're getting that this is equal to, this is continuing from over here, the limit as h goes to 0 of, if I FOIL that out, I'm going to get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared all over h. Now, the x squared and the minus x squared will cancel. So we've got the limit as h goes to 0 of 2xh plus h squared all over h. What's very nice about that is now there's an h in both terms on top. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of h times 2x plus h over h. Now I can cancel that h, and that's always going to be my goal because I'm always going to have this h, which is the run, in the denominator. I cancel that. We get the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. Notice here, I can now plug in 0 for h. h was my variable this entire time. x is a variable that's playing a different role. x, in this case, is representing a fixed but unspecified number. It's my point of tangency. H is the thing that's actually changing. It's getting closer and closer to zero. So when I'm plugging in, I'm plugging in zero for H, and we get 2X. So what we get is that the formula for the derivative of X squared is just 2X. And I can see that worked. When a was 2, f prime of a was 2 times that. Here I was just calling the input a, now I'm just calling it x. Okay. So if I wanted to know what's the derivative when I plug in 5 as the point of tangency, that's just going to be 2 times 5, that's just going to be 10. So I don't have to go through and evaluate a limit each and every time I want to take the derivative, I can now just plug into this formula which is kind of nice.